Listening Section Directions This test measures your ability to understand conversations and lectures in English. The listening section is divided into two separate timed parts. You will hear each conversation or lecture only one time. After each conversation or lecture, you will answer some question on it. The questions typically ask about the main idea and supporting details. Some questions ask about a speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speakers. You may take notes while you listen. You may use your notes to help you answer the questions. Notes will not be scored. In some questions, you will see this icon. This means that you will hear, but not see. Part of the question. Some of the questions have special directions. These directions appear in a gray box on the screen. Most questions are worth one point. If it is worth more than one point, it will have special directions that indicate how many points you can receive. You must answer each question. After you answer, click on Next, then click on OK to confirm your answer and go on to the next question. After you click on OK, you cannot return to previous questions. In an actual test or during this practice test, a clock at the top of the screen will show you how much time is remaining. The clock will not count down while you are listening. The clock will count down only while you are answering questions. Click on Continue at any time to dismiss these directions. Listen a conversation between a student and the librarian at the university library. Hi, um, excuse me. Ms. Johnson. I'm doing a project about, you know, technology and education, and I need some reviews, but I'm a bit lost. Hey there, Tom. No problem at all. I'm here to help. What do you need? Well, I don't really know which newspapers or magazines to look at, and I have no clue about the publication dates. No worries, Tom. We can figure this out together. Do you have any newspapers or magazines in mind? Not really. I'm not sure where to start. That's okay. For tech stuff, you might want to check the New York Times, The Guardian, or The Wall Street Journal. They talk about tech a lot. Now and about the dates, we can use our special library computer things to find out. Oh, we can do that. I had no idea. Yep, it's easy. We use something called ProQuest. It has lots of newspapers and magazines. We can type in your keywords and pick a date range. Let's go check it out. Wow, this is cool. I had no clue this was here. And how do I know if the reviews are recent? Great question. After you type in your words, you can make it show the newest reviews first. That way, you get the latest ones. Okay, got it. This is much clearer now. Thanks a bunch, Ms. Johnson. No problem, Tom. If you need more help or have more questions, just ask. Good luck with your project. Thanks again. I'll do my best. What is the main topic of the conversation between Tom and Ms. Johnson? According to Ms. Johnson, which newspapers or magazines does she suggest for tech-related information? Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. Yep, it's easy. We use something called ProQuest. It has lots of newspapers and magazines. We can type in your keywords and pick a date range. Let's go check it out. What does Ms. Johnson mean when she says? We use something called ProQuest.
Why does Ms. Johnson mention ProQuest? What is the likely outcome of Tom using ProQuest to search for reviews? Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. The class is discussing animal behavior. Okay, everyone, let's say you're a hungry lioness out on the savanna. You haven't eaten in a while, and your tummy is rumbling like a lion cub practicing its roar. Suddenly, you spot a juicy zebra grazing in the distance. Your hunting instincts scream, go get it. Food. But then, you notice a pride of hyenas lurking nearby, eyeing the same zebra with their drool-dripping grins. Your survival instincts whisper, danger. Maybe not today. So, what does the lioness do? Does she risk the hyenas for lunch or play it safe and find something else to munch on? Excellent question, Sarah. That's the beauty of conflicting drives. Animals have both instincts for immediate needs, like hunger, and longer-term survival needs, like avoiding danger. The decision they make depends on a whole bunch of factors, like how hungry they are, how confident they feel, and even the size of the hyena pack. Let's take another example. Have you ever seen a mama cat grooming her kittens? It's adorable, right? Those sweet little licks keep the fur clean and healthy. But imagine this, while mama cat is busy grooming, a sneaky mouse scurries across the room. Her hunting instincts twitch. Should she stop grooming and chase the mouse, potentially leaving her kittens exposed, or prioritize their care and comfort over a tasty snack? Again, it's a balancing act. Mama Cat might just lick a little faster, keeping an eye on the mouse while sending her sent message to the kittens to stay close. Or, if the mouse is too tempting, she might leave her babies for a quick chase, trusting their instincts to stay hidden until she returns. The fascinating thing is that these decisions aren't just random. Animals have evolved to weigh their options based on their environment, past experiences, and even the needs of their group. A lone wolf might take more risks than one protecting a whole pack of pups. And a seasoned eagle, with years of hunting under its feathers, might approach a prey differently than a young, inexperienced one. Conflicting drives can also lead to some pretty amazing behaviors. Some birds sing elaborate songs to attract mates, but those songs can also attract predators. So, they often sing loudest at dawn and dusk, when their predators are least active. Clever, huh? So, the next time you see an animal, take a moment to think about what might be going on inside its head. Is it a battle between hunger and caution? Or maybe love and danger? Remember, animal behavior is rarely one-dimensional. It's an intricate dance between competing drives, shaped by evolution and played out on the grand stage of the natural world. What is the main topic of the lecture in the biology class? According to the professor, what factors influence the decision-making of animals in conflicting situations?
What does the professor mean when she says? Again, it's a balancing act. Why does the professor mention the scenario of a hungry lion as spotting a zebra and then noticing hyenas? What is the likely outcome when a mama cat faces the dilemma of grooming her kittens or chasing a mouse? What can be inferred about animal behavior from the professor's examples of the lone wolf and the seasoned eagle? Listen to part of a lecture in a literature class. Imagine yourself standing on a hilltop, surrounded by the vast, vibrant landscape of nature. You feel the breeze on your face, the sun warming your skin, and the whispers of the wind carrying stories of life in every rustling leaf. That's the kind of experience Emerson invites us to share in his writing. He wants us to see the world anew, with open eyes and curious hearts, to discover the beauty and wisdom hidden in the most ordinary things. But Professor, Emerson uses some pretty big words sometimes. Does that mean his writing is difficult to understand? Ah, that's a great question, Ethan. While Emerson does use sophisticated language, he's actually a master at weaving together complex ideas with simple, powerful imagery. Think of it like finding a precious pearl inside a rough oyster shell. You might have to work a little to get to it, but the reward is worth the effort. One of Emerson's key themes is self-reliance. He encourages us to trust our own inner voice, our intuition, and our ability to create meaning in our lives. He's like a friendly guide on a hike, pointing out the wonders around us and reminding us that we can navigate our own paths. Another essential aspect of Emerson's writing is his connection to nature. He sees the natural world as a mirror reflecting our own inner landscapes. He writes about trees reaching for the sky, rivers flowing with purpose, and birds singing their vibrant songs all reminding us of the interconnectedness of life and the potential within each of us. Of course, Emerson wouldn't be Emerson without a touch of transcendentalism. This philosophy emphasizes the spiritual dimension of everything, the belief that there's something greater than ourselves out there, woven into the very fabric of existence. Emerson invites us to tap into this spiritual energy, to see beyond the everyday, and discover the divine spark within each living thing. Now, as we prepare to explore this specific essay, remember that Emerson is like a poet playing music with words. He wants us to feel the rhythm of his sentences, the imagery that paints pictures in our minds, and the ideas that resonate deep within our souls. Don't get hung up on every unfamiliar word. Instead, let the overall melody guide you. What is the main theme of Emerson's writing, as discussed by the professor?
How does the professor describe Emerson's use of language? What does the professor mean when she compares finding a precious pearl to reading Emerson's writing? Why does the professor mention Emerson's connection to nature? How does Emerson view the natural world, according to the professor's description? What can be inferred about the professor's approach to understanding Emerson's writing? Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Professor Evans, I, I need your help. My history project, the one about the gold rush, it's not going well. Take a deep breath, Sarah. What seems to be the trouble? Everything. I feel like I'm digging for gold in all the wrong places. The library books are heavy on numbers and dates, but I want to tell the story of the people, the miners, the families. I want it to be real, you know. Ah, I see you understand the heart of history. It's not just about events, it's about understanding the people who live through them. Exactly, but I can find those voices. The sources I have are like whispers, not shouts. Have you considered alternative sources? Letters, diaries, even newspaper articles from the time. They can bring history alive with first-hand accounts. I didn't think of that, but are those even in the library? They sound really old. Older than you think, but yes. The library has a special archive section with primary sources like the ones you mentioned. It's a treasure trove waiting to be explored. Wow, I never knew. But what if I don't know how to read them? Some of the handwriting looks like chicken scratch. Don't worry, you're not alone. The library has resources to help with that too. There are even workshops on deciphering old scripts. And remember, I'm here to guide you every step of the way. You really think I can find the voices I'm looking for? Absolutely. This project has the potential to be something truly special. Think of it as your own gold rush, unearthing hidden stories and giving them a voice. Remember, Sarah, history is made of whispers, too. You just need to know where to listen. Thank you, Professor Evans. I feel so much better now. I'm ready to dig again, this time in the right place. What is the main issue Sarah is facing with her history project?
What does she want to focus on? What suggestion does Professor Evans give Sarah to enhance her history project? Why does Professor Evans mention workshops on deciphering old scripts? What can be inferred about Professor Evans' teaching philosophy based on this conversation? Listen to part of a lecture in a geology class. Imagine this, you're in a vast, sun-baked desert, surrounded by silent sand dunes and sculpted rock formations. Suddenly, you look closer and see something unbelievable, huge rocks, heavier than even your backpack, have mysteriously shifted, leaving long tracks in the sand. This isn't a mirage, but the real-life wonder of sailing stones. Wait, Professor, rocks don't just walk, right? What makes them move? Excellent question. We scientists have been scratching our heads over this puzzle for decades. There are several theories floating around, each with its own unique explanation. One popular idea is the wind and ice dance. Imagine a cold winter night in the desert. A thin layer of ice forms on the ground, making it slippery. Then, along comes a strong gust of wind. If the wind catches a rock just right, and the ice provides enough glide, it might start scooting across the surface. Think of it like a tiny boat sailing on a frozen sea. Another theory involves a watery waltz. During flash floods, which are sudden bursts of heavy rain in the desert, water rushes across the dry land, pushing and nudging rocks along the way. Sometimes, these floods can even lift the rocks slightly, allowing them to travel farther and leave longer tracks. Some scientists suggest a teamwork tango between wind and water. In this scenario, strong winds wouldn't directly move the rocks but would blow sand and pebbles against them, slowly pushing them over time. And in some cases, water might soak the ground, making it soft and slippery, further aiding the wind's work. But the story doesn't end there. Some researchers believe a hidden partner might be joining the dance, ice volcanoes. These unusual formations, made of ice and mud, can erupt in cold desert regions. When they burst, the force of the explosion could send nearby rocks flying, leaving them scattered in all directions. So, as you can see, the mystery of the moving rocks is still unfolding. Each theory has its own strengths and weaknesses, and it might even be a combination of factors that makes these giants take a stroll. The investigation continues. Using new technology like time-lapse cameras and GPS trackers to catch these dancing rocks in the act. What is the main mystery discussed in the lecture?
According to the professor, what condition makes the ground slippery for the rocks to move? What does the professor mean by the wind and ice dance? Why does the professor mention time-lapse cameras and GPS trackers in the lecture? How does the professor connect the theories of wind and water in moving rocks? What can be inferred about the current understanding of the mystery of moving rocks? <laughs> 